Welcome everyone to Audiobooks from Hell. I am your host, Sean DeRigger. And uh, today on the podcast, really excited to have this guest. I did a book for, uh, not necessarily for them, for one of their authors, um, The Fetishists by A.S. Coomer was a, a release of theirs. Um, so today I have C.V. Hunt from Grindhouse Press on the podcast, who is an author in her own right. So welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me on. I uh, So I first you know, found out about Grindhouse Press when I jumped into this audiobook game and um, found the fetishists to audition for. And I read the synopsis. I saw the art especially. And I was like, wow, this is something that I would you know, really love to, to narrate. And um, so then I started kind of clicking around the Grindhouse Press uh, website and just all the, the books and the genres. I was like, oh, this is a horror, you know, a hor- horror press, horror publisher. And, uh, and I fell in love immediately. So um, when, did, when did you start Grindhouse Press and kind of what were the events that led up to Grindhouse Press kind of coming into being? Um, so originally Grindhouse Press, um, actually on uh, April 6th, it was the 10 year anniversary um, it was originally founded by Anderson Prunty. Um, he started it. Um, he was um, published with some other people and decided he kind of wanted to break away from that genre or, you know, uh, sort of start self-publishing essentially. And uh, yeah, he started um, Autolotl Press and Grindhouse Press uh, up until 2017. Um, you can imagine running two small presses <laughs> and being a writer. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, is a little daunting. So uh, he was trying to decide what he wanted to let go. And it kind of looked like he was going to let uh, Grindhouse Press uh, go away and just uh, focus more on auto auto um, as that's the kind of stuff that he wants, he, mm-hmm. he likes. And I was just like, no, I can't let Grindhouse go. So I took it over in 2017. Um, and basically my philosophy when I took it uh, was that, you know, I'm an author There are things that I kind of would want and expect from a small press. And I just seen a lot of small presses kind of like failing to deliver those um, at the time. And uh, yeah, so my philosophy was just to I wanted to treat the authors how I would prefer to be treated if I were working with a small press. And and here we are today. (laughs) Yeah. And and small presses are very interesting because it's such a different uh, such a different animal than like a major press. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's very, I relate everything to, cause I, you know, uh, I was involved in the music, music industry for a small time years and years ago. Um, compare this to like, you know, independent record labels to the major labels, all that's kind of, I have no idea with how that works right now, but, um, you had all the ind- independent, you know, labels putting up records, um, and then the major labels would buy them up and whatever. And then you have the independent film you know, industry as opposed to like the mainstream major film industry. I mean, it, it all kind of, you know, for me kind of hovers in those, I guess, compartments, I guess. Yeah. Um, and the one thing that really struck me, especially with Grindhouse Press compared to a lot of other um, smaller publishers or independent publishers is kind of the attention to, um, I think you have a folk, like you see a Grindhouse, a Grindhouse Press release, you're like, oh, that's a Grindhouse Press release. From like the artwork to the the stories, the genre, um, all all down the line, is that something very specific that you you know go after? Because the the artwork number one is like so above and beyond so many smaller presses that I see. Yeah, it's um, I kind of like my inspiration for the the artwork was like you know I would look at you know, like old grindhouse films from the sixties and seventies and like the video nasties and how, how they had like these very, each was unique and very kind of striking and kind of, you know, would either grab your attention or tell the story without even having to watch the movie type thing. Um, so, and first and foremost, I mean, I started writing when I was like 30. Um, uh, so I was more of a visual artist before I was an actual writer. I did a lot of like you know, painting and drawing and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I just, I see something, I know how I, what I like and, and, and a lot of times like dealing with a, um, cover artist, I will throw things at them. Like, you know, I recently just threw like street trash at somebody. I was like, (laughs) yeah, I was thinking like, you know, the cover street trash, it's got these like day glow colors and, you know, but it's kind of gross and grimy at the same time. Um, you know, I've, you know, 
uh, reference like Nicholas Winding Refn you know, has like the the great pinks and purples and neon colors and stuff like that. So there will be things like from movies that I or even like album covers. Uh, I've used album covers uh, as like inspiration. Like I'm just constantly looking through these things and just like um, I used to go to like bookstores too and just kind of pull random books off the shelves and just like look at them be like, well, that's a cool concept or, you know, and just throw those ideas at at cover artists too. And I, I do some design, but, um, I, I also work like, uh, with, um, probably about four or five different artists and stuff now. So. Yeah, it's it's very intentional and I can tell, I mean, I was talking with Grady Hendrix on the last show because we were talking about, you know, the eighties, you know, paperbacks from hell. And, you know, I just love browsing through, covers i'm 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 definitely a judge a book by its cover <laughs> kind of yeah. person um and i think today especially today's market we are you know visual we're a very visual society um and it's striking to me that um a lot of the major publishers go for very bland kind of cover art very you mm-hmm. know like walmart barnes and noble ish that's the only thing that i can really think about kind of comparing them like You'd see them on the shelves there. So it's not as fun for me to kind of browse. And I used to go to the, you know, the movie store and browse through all the VHS tapes and look at all the covers. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, 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 for me personally, it's something that I'm very, uh, very tuned into. So, yeah. And, and I think for me, too, it's like my whole goal when dealing with like cover art and stuff like that is like, you know, for the most part, most people when they're looking for books at this point, a lot of them are doing it online. So uh, yeah, it's like you got that one chance when they're scrolling through on that website, that little, you know, maybe an inch or two inch tall, you know, um, thumbnail. It's like either that picture has to grab them or the, the title has to grab that person, you know? So like, that's my goal. It's like when you're scrolling through, you know, 50 pages of, whatever horror novels that you're looking at. It's just like, I want ours to be like, whoa, look at that. That's kind of cool, you know? So, or that, that title's kind of screwed up, but uh, what's going on over here? <laughs> yeah, like a title, like a like, kill for Satan or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Smith's book. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so you're still writing as well. So like how, um, so you started writing when you were 30 and what kind of drew you into the horror genre specifically or, or, you know, or, or, or whatever, you know, I don't, I always, I don't, I don't like to put things right into a box, but horror is just easy to say horror. But I mean, what kind of drew you into that, that this type of genre as opposed to anything else? Um, I like to tell people that it's like, I didn't come from a a hardcore horror family, <laughs> but I came from like enough of a horror family that it's just always been kind of there. Um, like my dad was a huge cinephile. He watched everything. I mean, everything, Westerns, horror movies, dramas, you name it. He just rented VHS tapes all the time watching movies. And then, um, I have two older brothers. One's nine years older than me and the other one's seven years older than me. So obviously okay. <laughs> they were, you know, they were teenagers during like the, the eighties slasher yeah. film. Okay. So it was like, those were always on TV. Um, it, it was and, inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like <laughs> inevitable. And I, I even remember like as a child, like I was really into watching things like uh, my dad, I sat down with my dad and I watched basket case. Um, uh, but then I wasn't really into the slasher movies for whatever bizarre reason when I was like as a kid, but like then my mom, you know, she would just be like, well, you know, it's, it's just makeup. Here's this magazine, Fangora magazine, <laughs> yes. You know, you know, that shows you that none of this is real. It's all makeup. So I became obsessed with that, you know, so it's just always been like there, um, just like an, an upbringing and yeah. stuff. So you have been pretty, pretty incredible parents then. Yeah. <laughs> I see. I, I grew up in, in the 80s satanic panic where everything was bad. Like you can yeah. you watch The Exorcist, you were going to actually get possessed by <laughs> Satan. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you're not really into, weren't into that much in the slashers. I'm kind of the same way where I like a good monster story. Um, I like a good cult story too, just because of my upbringing. <laughs> I'm very yeah. fascinated with cults. Um, what, what do you kind of hover around? What, what kind of things do you like to explore as far as subject matters? Oh gosh. Um, 
I, as much as I was not into slashers mm-hmm. as, as a kid, I didn't really grow into liking them much until like my early twenties. Um, I was always really into like, uh, just more campy stuff when I first was watching, like as a teenager and stuff. I mean, I was, yeah, like the evil deads and, you know, um, Frankenhooker and stuff like that. Just the things that like almost drew from, uh, universal, you know, cause like I, I read something about Frank Henenlotter and he was talking about like, you know, his, uh, monsters were kind of intentionally bad because he was drawing from the universal monsters and how that stuff was kind of like not intentionally bad, but it was just like they were working with what they had then. So like he wanted it to have that feel of like, yeah, you could still see the zipper in the back of the Wolfman's costume, you know, <laughs> type thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, now I would say like, I almost really enjoy things that are like quieter and like super transgressive for some reason. Uh, things like, you know, The Invitation, um, the movie like The Invitation and stuff like that. Just things that are just more like almost like a character study. And then it you realize that like you're in the middle of a horror story, like halfway through, you're like, oh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and now I do have like a found appreciation for things like, yeah, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and stuff like that. It's just like, yeah, because nobody seems to really like when it comes to making movies anymore, they kind of shy away from things that are just like really super gory or uh, kind of transgressive. And those are the movies that get talked about, but like nobody enjoys watching them or something. <laughs> and it's just like, no, I enjoy watching those now. Um, yeah. No, more, I'm, I, more psych- I would say more like psychological stuff. I really yeah. like too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's so much I want to talk about cause there's so much you do so much and there's been, um, there's been so much kind of going on in the, even the audiobook industry right now. Um, and, um, but so let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about audiobooks for, for a little bit. Um, I recently listened to, uh, to cock block and okay. uh, narrated by Ramona master, uh, and, uh, talk about transgressive. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> was that one, uh, ex- how, how do I explain the plot? It's like a, it's like a dude bro zombie apocalypse. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, right. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to explain to people be like, well, it's like a zombie novel, but it's really more transgressive. <laughs> <laughs> that one seemed yeah. to be like, it had to be super cathartic for you, uh, mm-hmm. to write. And I know that I, I spoke to Ramona master about it and it was very cathartic for her to narrate as well. Yeah. So, um, what was kind of for that one, you know, just cause it's on the top of my head uh, of, my, of my mind right now. Um, what, what brought that one along? Was there any inspiration other than um, the present yeah. administration <laughs> yeah. and all that. No, yeah, it was, it was more of like the day. I mean, I don't want to get super political, but this is, you know, this is, this is <laughs> where okay. this, this is where the story came yeah. from. So like the day after, um, you know, Trump was elected, there were these, I just found horrific stories about, um, you know, people of color on subway trains and having, like these groups of people yelling at them, telling them to go back where they came from. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, uh, women saying that men were trying to, you know, sexually assault them by like grabbing them and saying, well, you know, Trump did it. So, you know, (laughs) uh, I don't know if we can curse on here. I don't want to, we can, we can fucking curse on here. Yes, 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 we can. This is a horror podcast. (laughs) It was the, it was, it was like, yeah, you know, um, the, the, the grab them and the pussy thing. It was, you know, he said, you know, the people like it was the day after he was elected. It was just like, you would hear these horrific stories of women being grabbed and groped, uh, uh, you know, um, women with the head scarves, their scarves being pulled off, um, people, you know, of color being told to come back where they came from. And I was like, it's just like, everybody has lost their mind. It's like, everybody is just like, losing their goddamn mind you know it's just like they're just doing these horrific things and it's just like it's like it's like an apocalypse it's just like yeah it's like it's them against us and it's just like well it's like a zombie 
apocalypse thing. It's just like these weird rando people who just think they can just do and say whatever the hell they want now because, you know, well, Trump said it, Trump did it, you know, and it's just like, I just found that horrific. And it was just like it, that all just kind of balled into yeah, <laughs> what came out in that story. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I highly recommend it. I had uh, a lot of fun listening to it um, while I was working. <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) it's it's yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty great one. Um, So as far as like audiobooks go. And I know that kind of like I've been talking to some independent publishers because I kind of touched on a little bit. But, you know, as a as a narrator for if we use, say, like ACX dot com, which is owned by Audible and Amazon um, as a narrator, if I did like a what's called a royalty share or a royalty share um, plus type thing, we would get uh, promo codes to give away. And we would actually get uh, <laughs> get the royalties yeah. on the promo code, which is bonkers. It's any other industry I've worked in. It's not, it's not how it works, mm-hmm. but you know, for us, it was, you know, for a while it was, it was nice. It was, it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, what's, what's the audiobook process, um, for you, like I know you give it over to the authors as far mm-hmm. as Grindhouse Press goes, and they can they have the rights and they can kind of do you do you list it for them and then they choose or do they list it on their own? Like how how does that work as far as the separation of audio rights and like Grindhouse Press? Uh, so with Grindhouse, I actually um, I only retain the rights for the English uh, language trade paperbacks. Um, they actually actually keep their Kindle, ebook, audio, visual, like all of that stuff. That's the only thing that I'm taking is the English trade paperback. So I walk them through the steps. Um, you know, if they've never done it before, I, I tend to have a lot of authors who've at least self-published once before, sometimes multiple times. Um, so they're kind of familiar with it, but then, you know, I will help them get their Kindle book. And then once they get their Kindle book, I tell them, you know, also if you're interested in audiobooks. There's this website, ACX, you know, here's the link. You can read through it. I mean, you can, you know, I have a couple of authors that are also musicians. One of them has decided to narrate one of his first book. Um, And, you know, I just tell him, it's like, here's all the requirements. You can either, you know, do a royalty split with the narrator or you can pay the narrator or production company an out-of-pocket per finished hour fee, like however you want to do it. If you have any questions, just get with me. And a lot of them is just, yeah, taking it upon themselves to uh, go ahead and just that one extra, you know, avenue of revenue. It's just like, here's this one more thing that I can do and try to make a little bit more money. And and they get 100% of it. So, and, and I encourage it too. I mean, we are in like an era of like, I, my regular day job, I just do data entry. I sit at a computer all day with headphones in. I listen to podcasts. I listen to audiobooks. I listen to music all day long. And it's just like, yeah, I encourage it. It's like me, I consume a lot of this stuff. And it's just like, yeah, if you know, you have the ability, I think, to make an audiobook and it's it it's not costing you anything. You know, if you do the 50-50 royalty split, it's not gonna cost you anything. Um, it's just like, yeah, it's I feel like um yeah, it's it's like one more way to make money, but also I think a lot of people I've I've talked to a lot of people who yeah their jobs kind of keep them busy so that you know most of the reading that they do is just actually like podcast and, and audiobooks listening. I mean I, I yeah I, I'm kind of the same way I I draw an AutoCAD all day and mm-hmm. I'm always on my desk for my day job and I'm always listening to something all the time. Um, do you think? Because um, I know that a lot of indie publishers or some that I've talked to because of the promo code thing, not not getting the royalties from that, because that was almost like a guaranteed, like 200 bucks, right? Yeah. Per title. If you can sling the codes and get someone. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and uh, so the codes are used to hopefully, hopefully generate reviews, which Mm -hmm. the reviews, more reviews, something, a, a book or an audiobook has on audible or Amazon from my understanding and correct me if, if I'm wrong. And, in this, um, the more reviews, the kind of the better the algorithm is at kind of picking it up or it, I don't know, people find it easier, I guess. Um, so 
but you know, but everyone was just snatching out the books. Nobody's leaving reviews. Like I'll give away a hundred promo codes and I'll get maybe, you know, 10 reviews maybe yeah. you know, out of that hundred. <laughs> um, and I can understand why Audible would want to kind of tighten that in and be like, okay, people are, we understand yeah. people are using it for, as an income. I had some people using it, relying on it for, yeah. for the job. And I'm like, no, 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 that shouldn't be how you do it. Um, so that's kind of the background there for our listeners there on, on all this. Do you see how you personally would, or you would encourage them, the authors to pursue audiobooks any differently is, do you think it would make it harder to get a better narrator? Like, what do you think? Does it, does it impact when you found that out? Did it impact you at all? Cause I know a lot of people were, and this is very inside baseball to our listeners. I know, mm-hmm. but um, this is the part of the business, you know, with, with the stuff. Did you have yeah. to feel, feel like you have to pivot a little bit? I did. Um, yeah. It's like, um, well, I was, I'm fortunate that the audiobook codes that I'm giving away right now fell before that date. Cause I think <laughs> yes. it's what March 26 yes. was the cutoff yeah. date. Um, yeah, but it was one of those things that I actually had an author that I, you know, musician encouraged him to look into ACX. He decided to narrate his own book. He uploaded the first time he had some issues with the files, you know, so he had to redo them and was literally in the process of re uploading them. <laughs> and he, and I texted him and I was like, dude, I know I encouraged you to do this so you can make money. I was like, but they just pulled the plug on <laughs> pe- paying people for the codes. And he's like, you got to be kidding me. But I mean, he still wanted to do it. He still wants an audio book, which is fine. But like, yeah, I mean, I would still encourage authors to do it. I mean, I don't, you know, you're not going to get a pay- as paid. Maybe, you know, it depends. You never you know. know. You, you never know. It's It's hard to tell. I mean, it's just like publishing a book. It's the same as publishing an audio book. It's just like you can't tell what is going to do really, really well and what might just, you know, for lack of a better term, just kind of flop. It's just like, you know, I, I put books out that I love to death and it's just like it's so heartbreaking to see like just for some reason or another it just doesn't garner very much attention. Um But, you know, I mean, you could still make money off of the sales. I mean, there are still I mean, I still purchase audiobooks, you know, like I purchase audiobooks. I get I download some from free when if, if I happen to see, you know, on the um the audiobooksunleashed.com, they have a lot of free codes um and stuff. So, I mean, I don't go crazy. I'm not like downloading every single one or anything, but <laughs> you know, uh it's like yeah, anything that kind of strikes my interest. Um but yeah, it's like now moving forward, I don't currently have anybody that I'm aware of working on audiobooks but it is one of those things it's like yeah now it's like you know, you can you'll get codes you know to help promote it but they're not you're not going to get paid from because like it was kind of like a guaranteed like you know here you're going to get some money uh just for telling people to go download your audiobook and they're not they're not paying for it so um but like yeah it's like moving forward it's like I wouldn't discourage anybody from doing it anymore. I don't think, but I would just be like, you can do it. It's this thing that you can do, but it's not like what it was before. And, yeah. Um, and, it, and it's almost, I think moving forward is a good thing for the industry. Cause I think a lot of people, a lot of listeners were getting just used to the freebies. Um, and then a lot of like narrators and authors, we were kind of getting a little lazy, like, Oh, well, you know, at least I can recoup some production costs you know, yeah. and I and now I was kind of using that as an excuse to take on a lot more royalty share. Where, what, as a narrator, I should be taking on some royalty share here, some royalty share plus, which is royalty share plus kind of a, I guess stipend or something like that. Um, yeah. To help pay for some production, like not as much as a full per finished hour book. Which, if I do that job, I get paid all the money up front, and then yeah. the publisher, the author keeps all the royalties so there's like these different ways of doing it and and i've just had to pivot and be like okay you know let me kind of figure out what i'm gonna do to kind of make all this work because we don't want to publish something and lose money on it and that's the like with anything with publishing you know you're putting all this money into a book you're you hire an editor um for the print you know for the print book you hire you know the artist so that's all money out of your pocket then you try to then mm-hmm. you then you publish it and you hope that it sells to recoup those costs and then make a profit and then you think about an audiobook you're like oh okay well now i got to pay for a narrator and you know or mm-hmm. pay for the production costs and it's all 
you just have to kind of plan more. And I think that's what's going to happen is I think a lot more people will have to just kind of sit down and actually get a marketing plan put into place. So and I think I always, we're going to be what, fine. Yeah. The only thing I think of is maybe some of the narrators, because um, some narr- narrators, you know, like they have the ability to do this quickly and, you know, like it was kind of a guarantee to make a little bit of money from, um, you know, the, the extra codes and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> but it's just like, I wonder, yeah, as, as far as like authors too, if there won't be some that kind of just back away from it, which would be sad if that yeah. does happen. But, um, it's I like, did speak you know, to one publisher who was thinking about backing away and I was like, oh man, please no. Cause your books are so good. Like I would do those for free. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like don't not do audiobooks because they're always, always, at least if I'm not, even if I don't break even, I'm like, I had a blast doing that. <laughs> like, yeah. and it's, it, and I did it, you know? So yeah, it'll, yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how people kind of pivot and I know some narrators are like, that's it. I can't work anymore. I'm like, why? You're doing this wrong. Create a yeah. business plan. <laughs> I know it's it's kind of like, um, you know, there's when when I'm dealing with the authors and I'm telling, you know, explaining to them about uploading their ebooks to like Kindle, and then like you know, Kindle is its own thing, and then there's other um, websites you have to go through that kind of distribute to everybody but Kindle, like Nook, Kobo, stuff like that. And it's just like, I always tell the authors, it's, you know, we kind of ask definitely for Kindle, um, you know, just so that, you know, it seems like most people go to Amazon to buy their books and ebooks and stuff. Um, but it's completely up to them whether they want to uh, have their books available for like Kobo and, you know, um, uh, Nook and all of those. Because like if you're Amazon exclusive, if you're Kindle exclusive, you can run deals, you can make your book free, you can done run countdown deals, you can do all kinds of things. But if you're not exclusive, you can't do those things. And I always just leave that up to the author. And there's some authors that are just like, nope, I want my book available everywhere so that anybody can read it. You know, anybody who has any kind of e-reader, if they want a paperback, they can get a paperback. If they want audiobook, they can get an audiobook. And it's just like, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I just kind of want it available for anybody, you know, because it's like I I consume a lot of audiobooks. So I know there are people out there who consume a lot of audiobooks um, that would be, you know, that would, would never read your book. Um, you know, that might be the only way that they consume books is through audiobooks. Um, so it's just like, I, I would definitely encourage it. And it's just like, it seems, you know, it does suck that they've taken that, (laughs) that money away, but it's just like, no, it's just like for the, you know, for that group of people who want to read the books, but they don't have the time to actually sit down and read it, but they can listen to it one, you know, on their drive to work or something like that. It's like, yeah, I, I prefer to keep it available. Yeah. 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 It definitely, uh, I, I think it kind of evens the playing field a little bit and, and, it, you know, we just have to adjust a little bit and, mm-hmm. and, and keep these, you know, keep things moving forward. Um, what, what do you, how do you approach, approach odd, the audio books? Do you, uh, cause you have, you know, you've done some for your, for your books. Mm-hmm. Um, what, uh, is is the audition process? Is it crazy? I couldn't even imagine. I'm going to be helping out um, in Psychopocalypse Publications, kind mm-hmm. of cast uh, a couple books of theirs, and um, it's down the road a little bit because the books are being scanned right now. But I'm like not looking forward to the audition process because I'm gonna oh, yeah. I'm gonna screen all the the you know the auditions, give them to uh, Mark, who's the publisher. He's gonna to listen to those and give his then give his favorites to to the authors to make a decision. How mm-hmm. what's your process like when you decide, all right, I'm gonna make a do an audiobook? Um for now I would rather I did narrate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rather somebody else do it at this point. It's just like yes. yeah, I'm not prof- a professional in any you know. You've done I'm a used... couple, right? A couple years? Yeah, I've done a couple. I'm not real <laughs> <laughs> not real into them. It's like, yeah, I I use like audacity, I barely know how to use it to edit the audio. And it's just like, I just prefer somebody else to do it. Um, so I, I do 50, 50, uh, royalty split. Um, just cause it, I don't know, it's just easier just to be like, yeah. Cause you, you know, like I said, it's like, you don't know some books will do very, very well. And some books just don't, you know? So it's just like, oh well, yeah, I would love to pay somebody, you know, an hourly 
wage for this, but it's just like, am I ever going to get a return on that? So, um, I do the 50, 50, um, for me, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, I don't think that, um, I don't know, like, I don't think that I'm too harsh, but I feel like whatever audio is auditioned to me is going to be the audio that is used in the book. So some people I think get a little trigger happy and they forget to, <laughs> and they forget to take out their line noise. Um, uh. yeah, the, they forget to tighten up their audio. I had like for Halloween fiend, this guy auditioned and I was in love with this guy's voice. He sounded like Tommy Lee Jones and it was <laughs> the greatest thing ever, but it was just like, a huge echo and it sounded like <sighs> not even a computer fan, like an actual fan or something running in the background. <laughs> and I was just like, I can't accept, I can't accept this one because it's just like, I'm just assuming this is what the audiobook is going to sound like. And it's just like, I don't know if he uploaded the wrong file or, you know, just, I think some people just cold read it, submit it. They don't edit it or anything. And it's just like, Oh uh, yeah. So I get a lot of those that I have to, surprisingly, a lot of those um, that I have to like weed out. And then um, sometimes uh, I've been pretty for fortunate the past few times. It's just like nearly like the first, second or third person who's narrated the the audiobook. It's like, that's that's the one, you know, that's the one that I uh, that I like. So I go with them. Um, I, I did with. Um, ritualistic human sacrifice. I took auditions and I just could not find somebody that really fit. So Anderson Prunty narrated that one for me. <laughs> like Anderson, was, do me a solid, man. <laughs> yeah. Cause he's narrated, I think like 18 or 20 uh -huh. of his own audiobooks, yeah. And I was just like, could you please do this one? Cause I know you, you got the atmosphere and you got the mood of it. So I know that you can, you know, I just want to kind of little deadpan. The guy's like a sociopath. So like unemotional and stuff. So, but not like, a, you know, not like, um, a monotone read or anything like that. So yeah. And I, I thought he did a, an excellent job because it was just like everything else. It was like, this person sounds too young. This person sounds too happy. You know, <laughs> it's, it's so weird how that is like, yeah, that can kind of really throw off an audiobook If like the person's just not narrating it, like what you hear in your head, you know, it's just like, I, I, I mean, I give a little leeway, you know, care, um, uh, the artistic, you know, merit goes to the narrator but sometimes it's just such a mismatch it's like this doesn't like yeah this kind of reads like a you know something not what i wrote or something but. <laughs> <laughs> i had somebody um um a publisher contact me because i everyone i work for I, I i try to keep a really good you know relationship with and we all I mean a lot of most of everyone i've worked with we've we've become friends and i had a uh, an independent independent publisher come to me and and uh, I was out to dinner and she sent me a Facebook message saying, is it normal for the narrator to just change the words all the time? <laughs> I, was, I was like, no, <laughs> they, no, they need to read the text, how it's written, unless there's a typo, like, unless it's like, yeah. it's an obvious like typo, but um, no, they should follow the, follow the manuscript. She's like, oh, so, she goes, okay, man. She goes, this guy's changing every other word and he's, and he's ad libbing and I'm like, what? Weird. Yeah. Like, I've like, never had that. <laughs> is this like an improv session? I don't understand. <laughs> I was so, narrators. If you're listening to this, if you're new to narration, don't do that. Read, just read yeah. the manuscript. Just your script is right there in front of you. Just read it. And, and if there is a typo too, I've had narrators come to me and they're like, uh, I think this is a typo. Yeah. You know? You have scrap instead of scrape. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, that is totally a typo. I was like, thank you for noticing that. I will go and fix that in the, you know, the 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 ebook and the in the paperback. And yeah, uh, uh, it, happens. yeah, yeah it, it happens. Yeah, it, it happens. I mean, an editor, you, you, even good editors miss things. And I, mm -hmm. I, I find things in the book I'm reading right now. I, and that's why I like being in contact with the authors and stuff, because it's like I need to have this the feedback. Because if I don't get any feedback, I'm just going to read how it's written. And I actually had a major yeah. publisher once tell me, we know it's missing something. They go, just read it as it is because it's already in print. It's already. I went, OK. Oh, <laughs> it, was, it was not necessarily a typo. It was it was continuity. 
<laughs> like yeah. the character placed his hat on a bench and then he ran and then he's away from that bench. He's away from his hat. And then it says he puts on his hat. And I was like, well, didn't he put his hat on the bench? <laughs> they were like, yeah. just read it. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're, we know, just read it. We're, we're done. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, that's, 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 that's hilarious. Um, anyway, I don't want to, you know, um, bag too much on, on narrator. Cause I, narrators, cause I, I had I, I did once have someone tell me that I was the worst uh, narrator they'd ever heard. It's one of my first reviews. Oh man! So I, I want to frame you, that but, sucker. <laughs> oh, we talk about this all the time. Audiobook reviewers are, whew, they are cut throat. <laughs> they are. <laughs> it is not like you know you you um you know you write a book and you put it out and then there's reviews on Amazon for the Kindle versions and the paperback version it's like yeah and if somebody doesn't like it i'm sure they'll be like i hated this book you know <laughs> blah 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 here's my reasons why i mean they will this person sounds like yeah i don't know just come up with these horrific yeah. <laughs> they're just they're just crazy. so so crazy yeah um yeah, Andy says that. <laughs> Andy says that he's gotten a couple or gotten a review where a person uh, called him. Uh, I sounded like a bored robot. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I've been called. I've been called robotic. Or one person didn't like me breathing. But we oh, breathe. Yeah. I had. I mean, it was before I had had coaching, and I'd have learned how to control my breathing since. But you know. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then my favorite reviews are. Eh, narrator was okay. Book was amazing. <laughs> da 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 da. Paragraph after, after paragraph. Eh, narrator is okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, Thanks. like on Audible, they have it broke down by like, yeah, narrator story mm -hmm. and whatever. Uh, where you those can get hard star. Too. <laughs> yeah, you get one star for narration, but like a five star for the story or something. Yeah. It's just like I'll, it is brutal. <laughs> I'll have authors uh, text me and be like, "Hey, so." They, so I got one star, but you got five. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> that sucks. So, yeah, it's 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 rough out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, let me see here. See, I'm getting all distracted. I'm like, what are we even talking? What are we even talking yeah. about now? Where did we even go? Um, let's see here. What was I? What's up here? All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, kind of some of the, like, cause the way you kind of, um, I guess build your year, I guess you hold kind of, you hold in a sense, kind of auditions for authors. And, um, I wanted you to kind of hear about your kind of your process for kind of building out your, you know, your roster or, or whatever for, for the year, um, um, yeah, it's, um, so when I first, um, uh, started the, you know, took over in 2017, um, it was like Andy had a lot of author friends and he was kind of publishing them and, you know, stuff. And I, the first thing I was like, I'm opening the submissions and I kind of want new authors that have not been on the press before. Uh, so I did that. And then my, another thing I wanted to do was like, I want to put these, books on a table at a convention where people who wouldn't normally see these books would see them, you know, like you go to a convention, you put uh, the books on the table and, um, you know, you've got people coming by and it's like, I've never seen anything like this before, you know? And it's just like, yeah, you know, we're Grindhouse Press and you can buy our books online. Um, but by going to the convention too, so the first year I didn't publish a whole lot cause I was really intimidated by the whole process. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, published the fetishist by, uh, AS Coomer and I believe just, um, John Wayne Communale's, uh, death packs and left-hand paths. If I remember correctly, it's, I kept it very small. And then I had a book that I published, um, and then I published one of Anderson Prunty's books. Um, but then the next year I opened up, I had gone to like scares at cares I met a bunch of authors that I have already, um, you know, run into before or whatever. And I've read their stuff, 
you know, I had read things. Um, and then, yeah, there was a handful of authors that I'm just like, I've read your stuff. I like your stuff. I think you, you know, if you're interested, you know what Grindhouse is about, you know, you can send something. Um, so yeah, I'm opening to some missions on, you know, this date, you know, if you have anything, send it or whatever. And that's kind of how I've been building it since is just, uh, um, I, the last time I opened the submissions, I got so many submissions that I actually liked that I actually was like enough to fill 2020 and 2021. So yeah, it was kind of insane. It was just like, there were return, you know, authors that I had published before. There were new authors that I had not published before. And, um, yeah. And trying to, I also take into account to like, I will talk to the authors as far as like planning when their book comes out. It's just like, are you doing any conventions? What conventions are you doing? What time of year are you doing it? Cause we can, you know, kind of plan things so that you have a new book from Grindhouse when you go to that convention. Um, so yeah, it's like, um, I mean, I read a lot of people's stuff and if I like it and I think that there's a sensibility to it and the writing's good and you know, it doesn't seem like it's, you know, uh, a lot of problems with like editing or anything like that. It's just like, yeah, you know, I think this person, uh, totally gets, you know, the grindhouse aesthetic. So sometimes I will, you know, just invite people to send something whenever they have something. Um, and other times, yeah, I open up the submissions and, uh, yeah, the last time it was just like so many, I was just like, okay, we're going to have to break this into two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I would be like a kid in a candy store running like a publishing company or something like that because I would probably say yes too much. I already say yes too much as a narrator <laughs> to, to projects. Yeah. That sounds great. This sounds great. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> you know? Do you do you find yourself like having just way too, way too much or did you just did it all work out for you to cover two years? Was there was there like things you had to be like I ha I have to pass on this because I'm booked out for two years. Um, there were a couple, I mean, there was actually one that fell into this weird category. I had one that, um, I liked it quite a bit, but it didn't feel quite grindhouse enough, mm -hmm. but with like Autolotl, um, they publish stuff that can be deemed horror, but it's more like atmosphere and mood that it is like, you know, visceral, you know like in your face, like gore or things happening, you know? Uh, so like that one, I actually, um, asked Andy if he was interested in taking a look at it and stuff. And he did, and he accepted, actually it's, um, it's Elaine by, uh, Ben Arzadi. Um, and, and, and Andy has published that book and stuff. Cause it's, um, yeah, it was, I, I liked it, but it was just like, yeah, I had so much. And I knew when I was, had reached the like limit on 2020. And I was like, I'm going to ask people if they're willing to wait until 2021. But like, I feel like a two year contracts like crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of, all of them agreed. And when I did that, it was just like, you know, I didn't, I think it kind of worked out great because it was just like, there were like five that I put into 2021 and then obviously after I had closed the submissions and stuff, it was like through the next few months and there were authors that I had already published before coming back and saying, you know, I have this thing. <laughs> would you be interested <laughs> in looking at it? And I was just like, yeah, I would. But just so you know, it's not going to come. It's not going to it's not going to probably be published until 2021. And yeah, it's like at this point, too, um, there's been a couple you know sliding last in for 2021 but like if i had any return authors coming back as aside from some other there's some other very small stipulations um uh that uh you know for the most part it'd be like we're all the way out till 2022 at this point because it's like yeah because andy opened uh autolotl to submission he took on some books for them and he is primarily who i use to edit um I'm just, yeah, I, I will edit, but I'm just not confident, confident with my editing abilities. Um, so if I edit, I'm just, I have like two people double check my work because <laughs> I'm so terrified that it's, it's going to be wrong or something. So, um, yeah, I mainly put it to him, um, unless that, you know, cause there are, I mean, it is what it is. There are some authors who need a little bit more work on, on their editing stuff. And there are some people that like you can 
barely touch it. And then like, those are the ones that I don't mind editing, but I'm also the entire time going, am I just missing things? <laughs> like I just, I just read like a, like a half a chapter and I haven't found anything wrong. And it's just like, yeah, it freaks me out. So, yeah. um, but yeah, with him, it's just like, I don't want to overburden him to where like he can't write again. Cause like then the, right. what was the point of me taking over Grindhouse if like he <laughs> is just stuck editing exactly. every single book on top and, and I'm publishing way more books under Grindhouse than, than he was when he, when he had it. So, um, yeah, so it's, a uh, I, um, yeah, he does most of the edits and stuff. I usually do the proofreads or I have another person who proofreads, but, um, yeah, I just, I trust him more than I trust myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, your roster is pretty fantastic. There's so many good books in here. Um, like The Fetishist, I read it and I fell in love with A.S. Coomer's writing immediately. Um, Brian Smith, of course. Um, Lucas Man Mangum, I had him on the show um, a couple weeks ago, as well as his narrator um, for Saint Sadist, which I think... Yeah is coming should come out soon audible's be. been yeah they've so. been real behind yeah <laughs> well one of my books i submitted 30 business days ago finally got approved so now i gotta wait two weeks so but um i can't wait to hear that audiobook oh, okay. um because he was like it made me cry i was like what are you serious <laughs> um matt serafini rights of extinction um just so much good stuff um and what I've read, I haven't read, because I've read a lot of horror, and especially with looking for auditions, I've read some of the, like, splatter horror stuff, stuff that just seems, like, super mean-spirited, like, like, almost, like, it, like, past the line of horror that I like, you know? Like, yeah. there's, like, a, for me, there's, like, a line. If it's, like, uh, if it's, like, just purely punishing and disgusting and grotesque for the sake of all that, mm -hmm. then I'm like, yeah, I'm going to tap out, you know. Yeah. Um, the stuff that I've read has been very, there's a lot behind it. Um, the, the stories are, are, are very original. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, do you have, do you have a, a personal kind of line like, all right, that's a bit too fucked up. Or is it, you know, does it just matter on how they, how the author puts the words together what's what's kind of I, your line yeah, I, <laughs> I think it's more uh, about the execution of it too because it, it's like I've gotten one before and I had to question you know um I haven't published it yet but it's it's you know it's something shorter but I was like there was like I got to like one spot and I'm like I don't I don't know how I feel about this and then I had to go back and, um, you know, kind of look at like, as I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, the, the person, um, it was like a diary entry thing that had been found. And then it was just like, uh, it was more like the internal thoughts of the character. I was just like, Oh, this person. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was just like, Oh, but wait a minute. This is this is a first person account from this character that's kind of heavily flawed and, you know, things like that. Cause it's like, you know, um, yeah, it, it, I think there has to be like a little bit of commentary. The characters have to be kind of strong. Um, there has to, a lot of times too, it's like, man, I, I, you know, I publish things that, uh, you know, the, the contents, questionable and transgressive <laughs> but it's like there there seems to be like a commentary sometimes even like a humor to it like it's so over the top like we've we've i've had conversations with people about this before it's like sometimes the horror can just be like so over the top if everything else comes together right it's almost comical you know it's almost like i can't believe somebody wrote this like you're laughing <laughs> while you're reading it type thing like i've gotten that with something like baby hater you know uh it's it's a short story you know uh, if anybody hasn't read it, it's concept about the woman's frustrated that she can't have children so she starts punching babies in the face okay <laughs> that's the concept <laughs> but it's so ridiculous and over the top the concept yeah. That it's just like people read it and they're like, that was hilarious. It's just like, it should be fun. It should be funny. 
<laughs> you know, it's like, I'm not telling him it should be funny, but like in the eyes of somebody looking on that on the outside, that's like, that's not funny. And it's just like, well, it's kind of written to be, you know, kind of like over the top campy and funny. So it's just like horror has so many different, you know, levels to it. It's like, you do have your camp, you know, horror, you do have stu- stuff that's just like super transgressive. You have extreme, you have splatter punk, you have, you know, social commentary, just like it's, yeah, it kind of has to be engaging and I feel like, yeah, um, it, it just can't be like gore, 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 gore all the time with like no character development and no plot, no structure. Uh, you know, th- th- there has to be something that compels the person to read what you're reading aside from just scene of gore, scene of gore, scene of gore over and over and over again. <laughs> and, the, and that's the thing, like horror has to be it has to be dangerous. It mm-hmm. it it you can't put a line on it. It does have to kind of want to cross that line and, 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 and tease that and tease and be dangerous because horror isn't good if it's put in, in boundaries. Yeah. You, know, you, you have to have that. And, and, uh, and that's why the genre I think has been, has been around for so long and has been so, I guess, successful. I would say horror is one of the more successful genres overall because our the fan like we're all just crazy for, <laughs> yeah. for scary stories and stuff to just we want to test ourselves even i kind of know where i land just because mm-hmm. i'm i've had kids i'm older i'm i'm, I'm like this must be my old age because i'm like that that kind of disturbed me and i don't know don't know if i want to finish or you know oh yeah, um, yeah but i'm a sucker for punishment so of course i'm gonna gonna finish because i lucas mangum's uh gods of the dark web but there was a scene a, a chapter in that where i was just like what yeah. the fuck i was I like know, dude I, why I did you just make me narrate you know um I, but but that's i think that is what i love about the genre so yeah i can't be like oh there needs to be a moral line in horror i think there's a i think you can be you know you, you can you can be provocative you can um, push people's buttons, but I think there has to be an artistic way to doing it and a point, I think. Yes. Um, and yeah. then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm all in. If you're punishing just to be punishing, you know, there's a, I mean, but that's the thing. There is stuff out, out there that, you know, there is a whole scene for that. So mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, for me, I just, uh, I always try to reference for people. I was just like, do you like John Waters films? <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, it's just okay, like, yeah. you know, then, yeah. then you kind of get it, you know, it's yeah. just like, it's, it's, it's yeah. And, and Lucas is a good example of that too. Cause like, yeah, God's, God's at the dark web. It is one of those things that like, when I, I listened to the audiobook of oh, it cool. and I hadn't had a chance to read it yet. So I was listening to it. And when it got to that point, I was like, Oh no, he's up. Oh, yep. Yep. He's doing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know? <laughs> I immediately poured a whiskey or yeah, a whiskey after that. I went straight out of the booth, <laughs> grabbed a bottle of whiskey and poured myself a glass. And I was like, I need a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's my goal with, um, uh, most of the, a lot of the grindhouse, not all of them. I mean, I do have some that are just more like dark fantasy or, you know, surreal horror and stuff like that. But a lot of times I kind of just, uh, I enjoy when readers are like, what the fuck did I just read? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's always good, and it, that yeah. I mean, with a name like Grindhouse Press, you have I mean, you have to deliver. I mean, that's if mm-hmm. anyone has watched Grindhouse films or anything like that, knows oh, yeah. that knows that it's like you 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 have to deliver on that, and, it, and that's the oh, thing yeah. I love. I I just the whole just the package, everything this package together with Grindhouse Press. You know, you're talking about the convention tables, like these mm-hmm. have to be just a thing of beauty. You know, put out on the table. Um, like I love it. It's everything I love about. Yeah kind of presentation and horror and and the whole convention scenes always always great um this year conventions probably not gonna happen yeah because we're all stuck in our houses if you're listening in 2021 or 22 or 23 there was this time when we were all stuck in our houses because of a pandemic yeah it's it's been pretty bad (laughs) we've uh let's see we were going to go to cinema wasteland Mm -hmm. um that's a great uh, convention yeah, Cleveland. We were actually, because that was supposed to happen this last weekend, and that was our Grindhouse had been around for 10 years. So we were going to celebrate 10 years of Grindhouse Press at uh, Cinema Wasteland, and it did not happen. It was a huge, huge disappointment. Um, 
but yeah, we were also going to go to, um, it's called oddities and curiosities. Um, it's, I think they pretty much have a show in almost every other state. Um, it's just weird and unusual things, everything from like taxidermy. They do <laughs> like, um, the suspension shows. I'm not sure if you know what that uh-huh. is where yeah. they, yeah, they pierce people's backs and lift them <laughs> off the ground. It's just chaos, you know, oh um, we preemptively went ahead and canceled that. I don't know if it's mm-hmm. still happening because it was like May and I'm just like, oh, I yeah. don't think anything's happening for a while. No. Um, and then we're still planning on being at Scares It Cares uh, Williamsburg, which is in August. Okay. But it's, yeah, uh, they had one in Wisconsin. I think it was supposed to happen this month that they canceled. And they've already said, you know, everything's just kind of wait and see at yeah. the moment. They haven't uh, canceled it, but they, you know, just making people aware, just like, you know, if this continues to go on, it probably will get canceled if it continues, but if they can get it under control, we might have it. So that one's in question, but um, yeah, one of the authors, Grindhouse authors, John Wayne Communale, I mean, he's pretty much, you know, he kind of, uh, left his day job to try to, cause he's also a musician mm-hmm. and he does other, uh, things like almost like theater type things. Uh, but like, yeah, he was going to conventions like almost every two weeks, like taking books, selling books, mm-hmm. selling his records, t-shirts, the whole nine yards and all of that. He said, yeah, all the way up yeah. until there was like a huge, um, indie lit thing called printers row that they have in Chicago in June. And they've already pushed it off to, God, when did he say, I can't remember, maybe September or October, mm-hmm. but yeah, they've everything he says, just everything keeps getting canceled and rescheduled and stuff. So like, he's just been sitting at home and it's just like, yeah. Um, yeah cause those, uh, he, those are huge because I mean, online sales are great, but I mean, mm-hmm. the conventions and things like that for, for companies like yours, yeah. you know, the, those are especially throughout the summer, you know, the main income for, for, you know, for publishers and musicians with with touring and, and everything, even like, you know, these movie distributors, most of the indie movie distributors, like, Mm -hmm. uh, like vinegar syndrome, synapse, um, those smaller labels that are all are at the same conventions, you know, there's a, there's a grindhouse, um, store, um, yeah, it's a uh, Grindhouse Tampa. Video. Grindhouse oh, yeah, Video. Yeah, yeah Tampa. Yeah, I, I actually ran into those guys at a awesome. convention in Let's Tampa. Ask. It was Spooky Empire. Yeah, 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 I ran into them. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I had some guy walk up to the table. He's like, are you guys with the Grindhouse Video? I was like, uh, no, that's something completely different. He's like, oh, because they got a booth up there. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, you should actually think about getting some of your books in his store once the store reopens. Because that would be yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, he's awesome. He's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I know him personally. So, so yeah. And then of course there's the bigger Grindhouse. Uh, there's the Grindhouse actually distribution company that I don't know if they're yeah. really doing. It's William Lustig's company. Um, yeah. So yeah, good stuff. Everything that has the name Grindhouse right now is awesome. Mm-hmm. So you got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we're we're running out of time here, but I was trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I wanted to ask you, but then I'll probably remember at midnight tonight and uh, (laughs) we'll be at a loss. But um, I wanted to thank you for taking the time and chatting with me about Grindhouse Press. And um, is there anything that's uh, that's newly released or coming down the line that people should be aware of? Uh, Let's see. Um, We got nothing really happening in April from Grindhouse, but in May, um, there will be a short story collection from Christopher Triana called Blood Relations. He's the author of Full Brutal. If you that is an audio book, if anybody has uh, <laughs> listened to that, um, and then I'm not sure if it'll be May, but if it's not May, it'll be June. Uh, but um, we're putting the final touches on another book by Scott Cole called Crazy Times, awesome. which uh, kind of is fitting for what's going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, and uh, the, the website is grindhousepress.com. I'll have I'll have a link in the show notes. Um, do you have an author page, or or can people people can find your stuff over on Goodreads um, and uh, Audible yeah, um, for the audiobooks and Amazon.com? Yeah, um, I'm also on Twitter um, at cbhunt doc, or not dot com. It's just at cbhunt. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have a personal page. Okay. I just uh, have the Twitter and yeah, uh, yeah. and then okay. I maintain the Grindhouse. Um, 
pages for um, Twitter and Facebook, and those are both at Grindhouse Press. Awesome. All right. I'll have all those links in the show notes, so you can just click on those and, and everything. And uh, and uh, I guess that I guess that's it. Um, CB all Hunt, right. thank you so much for joining me and talking with me today. Oh, thank you for having me on. 